Jesus knew they were trying to kill him. Remember, he just healed a guy who had a withered hand in church on the Sabbath day. A day that God himself, Jesus, set aside for rest and wanted to show us the importance of rest because there's a thousand year period after 6,000 years of work living on this planet. We're, we're almost at the beginning of the seventh day. That's the millennium, a thousand year period called rest where Jesus is going to rule from Jerusalem with a rod of iron. And he's going to rule it in love and the wolf will lay down with the lamb. There will be no carnivores. There will be no prey. There will be no predator. It's going to be a time of peace. And God set it up in the commandments. I want you to remember that time of peace that's coming. And Jesus Christ, God himself, came to this earth to bring that peace. You see, and when you have a cross, the cross, the finished work of Jesus Christ, supersedes every law that was written before it because those laws were pointing to that cross. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. It's important for us as Christians to quit trying to appease God by doing the right things. Jesus did the right thing. Are you trusting in Him at first base? That's where it all starts. It starts at repentance. It starts at forgiveness. It starts at the cross. The cross, when Jesus said, it is finished, He was meaning everything is finished. Just trust in his completed work at Calvary. If you are trusting in anything other than that, you are not going to heaven. You can't trust in yourself. You are a deceiver. You are a liar. You suck. But we serve a God who loves sucky folk. Aren't you thankful for that? He loves sinners. He's the friend of publicans and sinners. So Jesus heals this guy with a withered hand on the day of rest. And the whole emphasis of that story was, you guys are going to help a sheep. When he, if one of your sheep falls into a ditch and he's getting waterlogged and he's about to drown or die, he can't get up, he's cast down, you're going to go help him out and your neighbor's going to come and say, oh, let's get this little sheep out there. We can't have him suffering because we care for animals, kind people. The Bible says the righteous man cares for the life of his beasts. So we, take, we do good on the Sabbath day. Not evil. Jesus asked him that. Do you do good or evil on the Sabbath? Well, you do good. So you're going to help a sheep out, but you're not going to help a fellow who really needs it. Don't you understand the heart of God is about that which is on the inside of man, not the externals? God is dealing with men's hearts. He wants men's hearts at peace. He wants men's hearts at joy and love and patience and gentleness and kindness and endurance and long-suffering and self-control. He wants everybody's heart there. That's what he deals with. That's what he's working on you on. Not these outward exterior achievements in life. Hey, I did this. My resume says this. Yeah, but what about your heart? Are you miserable? You may be successful on paper. God's not looking at paper. He's looking at the soft tissue. The Bible says you are epistles written on your hearts. The epistles of God written on your hearts. And that's why we want you to have a tender heart today. The same sun that softens wax is the same sun right next to it that will harden clay. And what we want to encourage you to be is a people of soft hearts, tender hearts, moldable hearts, pliable hearts, ready to do what the Master says. Jesus knew these guys were ready to kill him, not for a bad work, but for a good work. And he says, but when Jesus knew it, he got away from that crowd. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Verse 16. And he charged everybody, hey guys, don't go tell them anybody about this. Let's get the story. He's just hanging out with a bunch of people who love to be seen. Who love to be known. Who love to let it be known that they've got the nicest clothes in the world. That God loves us most because we have money. God loves us most because we have education. God loves us most because we have more than you. See, that's what TBN preaches. God loves those with a lot of stuff more than he likes those with nothing. And the Bible says, no, 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 no. Have you considered those poor people in the Sudan who have nothing who love Jesus? Jesus loves them. Have you seen the pictures of the fellow this week in the Muslim country who had a cross burned into his face before they tortured him after that and killed him. Jesus loves that guy. You'd never heard about him till I mentioned it. I didn't hear about it till I saw it on Facebook. God saw it. God knows. God loves him. There's going to be many in that day who say, Lord, I ain't supposed to be going to hell. 
I had everything on the planet I was supposed to. You blessed me up there. Jesus said it ain't about your, the accumulation of things. It's about the accumulation of what you've done for the king. What have you done for him? See, this life will soon be passed and only what's done for Jesus will last. Where's your heart? And these guys, they, they're... they're Goals, they're everything, they're pats on the back. They lived for today's pat on the back. Look at that great guy in those cool clothes and how much he knows about God. And Jesus said, if that's your thinking, you don't know anything about God. Not to the strong is the battle. Not to the swift is the race. But to the true and the faithful, victory is promised through grace. God's looking for faithful followers who will take the next step in the same yoke with Jesus. That's what he's rewarding. That's what he's counting righteous. And that's the folks that will be raptured. Jesus knows that these guys are wanting to kill him for doing good. Why? Because he's taking their converts from them. And they have this sense that he's about to bring our religion to its knees. He's about to destroy what we've been building and our fathers have been building for years and years and years. And they were right. Because what they were building was for themselves. And Jesus says, I am coming to a people and we're going to build a kingdom of heaven. And God's going to be with you and he's going to bring you what these guys can't. He's going to bring you constant, constant love, constant joy, constant peace. While you're on your bed at night and you're sleeping and your head's on your pillow just before the time of sleep, if you can sleep. During times of echoing war all around you and rumors of war and the nations against the nation and rising. Jesus says, that's going to happen I want you to be able to go to sleep tonight. Don't you concentrate on the wars. You concentrate on the victor. Matter of fact, I want you to know this before you fall asleep. You, sir, ma'am, are more than a conqueror. You've already won. Go sleep. I got this one. But what if I die in my sleep? You'll wake up in heaven. See, one of the problems with Christians is we don't believe heaven is as real as it really is. The closer you get to Jesus, the King, the Creator, you'll understand how real heaven is and you won't have this fear of death. Matter of fact, you'll long for heaven. See, the old-timer songs used to write about that. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through, bruh. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me. They're calling from heaven's open door. I just don't feel at home in this world anymore. And when the closer you get to God, the closer you'll get to heaven. And the closer you get to heaven, you look into heaven's pearly gates, it's wide open, the doors are wide open. And you look down here to this old wicked earth, pearly gates, wicked earth, I want to be there. And that's where our hearts will be when you're walking with Jesus in his yoke. Just take the next step with him faithfully. Do what the manual says and be blessed. And he says, don't let me know, don't let everybody know about this, guys. Because Jesus wasn't about, he was just, the, you look to the religious people and Jesus is just the opposite of that. The religious crowd is, look at me, look at me, look at me, hear my voice, hear my voice, Here's what, hear what I say. Jesus is like, hey, small, still voice, I want you to hear what I say. But that requires listening. These guys, it wasn't about you listening. It was about me talking. Jesus is about you listening. That's why he gave you two ears and one mouth. We listen twice as much as we talk. We're supposed to. And Jesus said, let every man in the manual, in the yoke, the next step with Jesus is this. Let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to be angry. So how do I walk with Jesus patiently, in peace, today, tomorrow? Let every man be swift to hear his voice, slow to speak, Lord, I'm going to listen. I'm not going to talk here. Slow to speak out the word, blah, 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 and keep people, others around you from hearing the voice of God. Swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to getting angry. That's what the Lord requires of us. Remember the Old Testament requirements? To do the right thing, to be kind, and to walk humbly. Sounds kind of like the same thing to me. And Jesus, after he's been kicked out of church, after he's been threatened by the church, we're going to kill you, Jesus. You keep this up. He went quiet, quiet mode. And the people that followed him were the people that followed him. And the people that followed him, it says, and they came to him, and he charged all those that followed him that they would not make him known. 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. And just before that, what did Jesus do? They kicked him out of church and he went to healing folks. He went to raising the dead and healing the sick and doing the same thing he was doing earlier. And he was drawing attention away from the attention getters to himself. And a true Christian focused their attention not on the attention getters, but on Jesus himself. And when he follows you, our message is different today. We go noise it abroad. Why did Jesus tell these people, don't tell anybody what's going on? Because he understood it wasn't about pizzazz and ah, the tumult and everything. And he also knew it wasn't his time to die. And the way he was looking at it, he was in Capernaum. He wasn't supposed to die in Capernaum. He was supposed to die in Jerusalem. And the way he was looking at it, it was the religious crowd, the rabbis who were mad at him and wanted him dead, and their method of death was stoning. And he knew he wasn't going to come here to be stoned because not a bone of him would be broken. He knew that in Psalm 22, it was diagrammed and foreshown that he would be dying on a cross. And in Psalm 22, that was a, a method of death that didn't exist for another thousand years into the future. And Jesus was talking about being crucified on a Roman cross. A thousand years earlier than the time it was written. And Jesus knew he was there to be killed on a Roman cross. And he knew it wasn't his time yet. So he went incog. Because he wasn't going to die in Capernaum. And he wasn't going to die, uh, die by way of stoning. He was going to die in Jerusalem by the way of crucifixion. So he went underground. Because it wasn't his time. Remember when it was his time? John is the, covers the last ten days of Jesus in focus. And it says, and there he set his face like a flint stone. A flint stone is one of the strongest, toughest stones on the planet. Remember the tribulum in tribulation? When you get a wheat harvest, you, you sickle down all the wheat, you throw it into a pile on the threshing floor, and then you take a tribulum, it's a big old board, heavy board, and on the bottom side of it, they cut notches into it, and they forced flint stones into it. Flint stones were heavy, and they could sharpen them and all this other jazz. And then they would turn it over, and those flint stones, they would have a cow or a, an oxen or a donkey pull the cart and pull this tribulum, and it would break up all the chaff that needed to be threshing off of the grain, off of the wheat. And it was a flint stone. It was strong. It was usable. It was pliable. You weren't going to move it. It was going to move you. And when it was time for Jesus to die, it says he set his face like a flint, and he headed to Jerusalem. Because it was now time to die in Jerusalem by way of a Roman cross. And that's what he was teaching. That's what he knew. And that's why he told these people, hey, don't talk about me right now. It might be fulfilled, which is spoken in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I'm sorry, 42, verses 1 through 4 is what we're about to quote here. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. This is God talking to Israel. He was, first of all, this was concerning Cyrus a Gentile king who God was using as his locust, as his servant to do his bidding. Okay? But it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ because we were just told that in the book of Matthew. He did all these things that it might be fulfilled, which is written in Isaiah. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. And he says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen. God chose Jesus. Jesus is God's choice of saviors, of servants. My beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon Jesus, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Aren't you thankful that God has come to the Gentiles? For 2,000 years and longer, he worked with the Jew, worked with the Jew, worked with the Jew, worked with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And his focus was them. He sent the prophets to them. They killed the prophets. He sent the word to them. They buried the word. He sent gifts to them, and they collected upon themselves and didn't give God the glory. They didn't thank him for all their blessings in life. And it was all about them, 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 them. And he says, you're going, to re you're going to turn against me and I'm going to turn my heart to the Gentiles. And that's why when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he looked over Jerusalem and said, oh, Jerusalem, I would have saved you. I'm about to be crucified and you're not even going to notice it. But the Gentiles will. And I'm going to go to somebody who will listen. And that's what he was talking about. And he, he says, he will show judgment to the Gentiles. Verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Remember the opposition, the religious crowd, the Pharisees. They would stand in the most chosen corner on the street market at time of prayer. They would look at their watch. It's getting close. Five, four, three, two, one. Time to pray. Oh, dear God. 
I thank you I'm not like all these people here. I'm thankful you've made me rich because I'm so close to you. And you've given me this beautiful clothing because it represents your righteousness. I'm so righteous, Lord. I thank you I'm so righteous and so great. And they would voice out loud their great prayers of pride. The Bible says when you see my messenger come, he's not going to be shouting in the streets. That's why when these guys were shouting, Jesus went incog and he went underground and he was quiet. And that's why when you hear from God, it's going to be a small, still voice. But know this, and those of you that have heard this voice know this to be true. When that small, still voice comes to your heart, it'll seem like it's on a bullhorn and it will point its finger in your face and you'll say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whether it's the Holy Spirit came for what reasons? To convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Lord will point your sin out to you and he'll give you attaboys too. And when his small, still voice comes, it'll resound in your soul. It'll resound in your spirit. It'll be like the PA system has been cranked to 10. And that small, still voice, that's why it's important for us to quiet the ways of the world out so I can hear him. Because he's meek and lowly in heart and he's not going to overspeak over other people. If other people are talking and you, you get your attentions on them, he's going to wait till your attentions on him. Jesus, do you have anything to say? Oh, matter of fact, I do. Quiet the noise, a creation of Satan. Find a quiet place where it's just you and Jesus. And hear his voice. It is small and quiet. He will not be screaming in the streets. Continuing on, verse 20. A bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench. It's kind of a weird saying. A reed is a very tender plant. It's a hollow plant. And they're tender to begin with, but when you bend one, it's no good. That's what a bruised reed is, a bent one. They would use reeds to make papers, to make paper. And you needed them whole. They couldn't have holes in them. They couldn't have bent marks where when you unbend it, it'll tear. It's a very tender plant that's bent. And Jesus says, he is not coming to stomp the worthless. Oh, that reed's bent. Jesus says, no, no, we'll unbend it and we'll make it useful. Jesus is not coming to, to break down the broken. He came because the broken exist. Jesus is not going to stomp those who are down. And he says, that's what these guys yelling on the street corner are doing. They are useless. They are garbage. They are speaking a lie. They're not even close to the truth. But Jesus says, I've not come to destroy them. I came because I want them saved. And when you look and you'll see where Jesus laid in a tomb, he laid in a man's tomb whose name was Joseph of Arimathea, who was part of that crowd who finally believed. When you read John 3, the greatest verse in all of the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you know who he was talking to? He was talking to one of those bruised reeds guy by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus would hear him speak in the day, but he was afraid of all these guys that he was around because they hated Jesus so bad. And he's thinking, man, if I become a follower of Jesus, they're going to hate me. They're going to want to kill me. They're going to want to destroy me. I'm with them every day. And so he came to Jesus at night, John 3, 16. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same guy came to Jesus by nighttime and said unto him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a man come from God, for nobody can do the miracles that you're doing except God's with him. And Jesus looked right at him and says, thanks for the flattery, but unless you get saved, you're going to hell. Unless you're born again, you will not see the game. Nicodemus said, I didn't ask that question. Jesus got right to the facts. Because when that small, still voice speaks, he's not, he, he doesn't talk about the weather. He doesn't talk about that which doesn't matter. When the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you, he uses less words, the least words possible, to get his point across. And many times they're two and three word phrases. Stop that. No, go ahead. Step out in faith. Do it, buddy. Small, short phrases. Not even full sentences sometimes. But we need to be listening and ready and attentive and willing and obedient and shut out all the noise so we can hear him because he speaks in that small, still voice. And he says, I'm not come to stomp these guys. I came to save them too these worthless ones. And he says, and the flax shall he not quench. Flax was used as wicks in oil candles. And flax would, it was the wick. My wife bought a candle the other day, 
It's got a wooden whip with a patent pending thing in it. It's the neatest thing. I was like, how does that thing not burn out? And you can, it's like sitting next to a little campfire. You can hear it burning. It's like, how does it not burn out? That's amazing. Flax was the same way. Flax was used in little oil lamps as the wick. And it's like they were supposed to send out light. But once in a while, you'd get a dud. And it would, it would be lit, but it wouldn't send forth a, a light. It wouldn't send forth a flame. It would just send forth a bunch of smoke and smoke up the house. You know, right when you blow out a candle and all that smoke that comes up. The candle was enjoyable. It's that smoke that's not any good. And Jesus is saying, these Jews, these Pharisees are like smoking your eyeballs, man. They're not, they're not blessing anybody by their presence. They're burning out your eyeballs. There's a stench among them, among the nostrils of God when he's in that crowd. But he says, I didn't come to snuff them out. I came because I love them. I want those guys who are wrong, I want them right. Those guys who are bent, I want them straightened. I don't want them stomped. That's what he first meant by it because that's the context of his conversation is these guys. Secondarily, it's you. You ever been bent, beat down, bent over, felt useless? Jesus comes by and says, man, dude, don't think it's over for you. Don't, just because you're beat down in life and because you've got a hollow middle and you seem like you, you, in your own eyes you're not of any use, I'm telling you, you can be. I want to use you. I want to straighten you out. He didn't come to stomp you while you're down. He came to encourage you, not discourage you. Jesus wants to lift you up. If you are feeling like a bent reed today, understand that the voices of negativity have nothing to do with heaven or its king. Jesus comes alongside to encourage you. He didn't come to stomp you. And if you're feeling these desires or thoughts or this, these impressions that, oh, you're just not good enough and, oh, God's mad at you, you're wrong. He just told us in today's passage that is not why He came. He didn't, came, he didn't come to pull up and root out and get rid of bad things. He came to make you better. He's here to make you better. Do you believe that? The flax represents to the Christian in the, in the Christian perspective. Oh, I'm just not as strong as Christian as old dude over there. They talk about Jesus all the time. They soul win, blah, 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 blah. Do you guys know that most forest fires, raging forest fires, are started by little sparks? If there's a little flame there, don't count yourself out. If you believe that oh, everything I do is a mess and I just create smoke in people's eyes and I wreck their day and I just don't do anything, right? Quit listening to those voices. Jesus Christ didn't come to stomp you out or put your light out. He came as the Holy Spirit to provide wind on your flame, on your smoldering campfire so it can become an ignition of His world. Where you step is the light of heaven. You need Jesus to get your flame going. He didn't come to put you out because you ain't as good and godly as the next guy. He came to fire you up a little bit more and encourage you. So you'll be able to do that. He's the light of the world and he's called us to be his light. He doesn't want to put you out. He wants to help you grow. He wants to encourage you, not discourage you. If you have the feelings of discouragement around you today, know that is not the voice of God or his servant. His servant didn't come to do those things. His servant came to heal you and make you a better you, a stronger you, something opposite of what you think you are to be, something far greater than what you ever thought you could be. See, a bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax will he not put out until he sends forth his judgment into victory. You see, what you won't hear Joel Olstein and others like him preaching is at first base, if you don't hit first base in life, the king at first base is going to come down. He's going to pronounce death judgment on the entire world. And the Bible talks about a 75-day period where Jesus in that 75 days is going to go on a killing spree. And he's going to find his enemies. And the Bible says he's going to send forth his angels. Two will be working in the field. One will be taken and the other left. That has nothing to do with the rapture. That has everything to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back to this earth after the rapture, seven years later. And he comes to set up his shop, and before he sets up his shop, he's got to rid his kingdom of wolves. He's going to rid his kingdom of Nephilim, Satan offspring. He's going to rid his kingdom of all that stands against him and will lead others against him. 
Just like all the people in the land of Canaan when Moses was supposed to cross over and he didn't because of his sin, Joshua comes in and God says, I want you to take all the inhabitants and drive them out of your land. Those who you don't kill, get rid of them. They didn't do it all. See, the word Joshua is the same word Jesus. Yeshua, when you read the book of Joshua, you've got to see that he is a type of Jesus Christ. He's a type when Jesus Christ gets back here to the land of promise in the land of Canaan and rids the inhabitants. You don't hear Joel talking about that. There is going to, Jesus is going to look into the eyes of some people and they will die. And their blood will be spattered. But not right now. There's coming a day when that happens. Right now, he's not going to stomp the bruised reeds. He wants you saved. You're in a day of mercy. He's not going to put out your fire. He wants you to be ignited. And he's going to be the source of your ignition. But there is coming a day of judgment. And his judgment will always lead to victory. And the Bible says his angels at the end times are going to be his harvesters. And he's going to come into an area, into a continent. He's going to point over there and there's going to be two in the field. One will be taken. Bring him here. Boom. Get in line. And one will be left. He's going to go down to the mill and there's going to be two women. They're going to be grinding at the grinding stone at the mill. And one of them will be taken. Get her over here. And the other one will be left. And he's going to take his collection of people and with his word and with his light, he's going to destroy them all. You will, would not follow me. You allowed Satan into your life. You now allowed the Nephilim seed up in your head. You got the mark of the beast. You are dead. You're going to destroy them all. And the Bible says that process plus the cleansing will be a 75-day process. You're going to go throughout the world doing that. There's a time when he's going to stomp the reeds. And there's a time he's going to put out those who won't flame up for him. But not now. There's still mercy today. He's the God of mercy, not the God of judgment. And he wants you to listen to his voice during the time of mercy, knowing that there is coming a day of judgment. Those of us that are walking in the yoke with him, that are taking the next step with him, we will see none of this. We will walk to his house one day, toward his house, and he finally says, hey, y'all ready? Y'all want to go to my house? And we're like, yes, Lord, we do. And he's going to take us. Who goes? The faithful who are walking with him when the time comes. Verse 21. And his name, in his name, shall the Gentiles trust. Anybody in this room a Jew? You're all Gentiles, it looks like. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that when people said, we don't want him, we want our, we're going to put our own flame out. He said, well, I'm going to have a flame. It's going to be people who hear my good story. They're not going to trust in the way they were brought up and what they were taught in their Christian school or their Christian church. They're not going to trust in some old Sunday school teacher who was unlearned, never knew her Bible, just read the quarterly and asked you to pray for her. He's looking for people who get into the Word and know, know the author. That's what he wants. And you and I come along and say, and you're the author and you come to us? You want us part of the kingdom of heaven? And we, we weren't the first ones. It was the Jews who were first. First shall be last, and the last shall be first. You know what that tells us? That tells us he's going to work with them again, too. He chose them first. They said no. He came to the Gentiles, and soon, very soon, the end of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, the fulfillment of the Gentiles. We will be raptured. And then he's going to turn his heart and his focus right back to the people he came to save in the first place. And he's going to save them. The last shall be first. That's us. We were chosen last. They refused. He came to us. We said yes. We're first. We're the first ones raptured. We're the first ones gone. We're the first ones out of here. And the first shall be last. He's going to turn his attention back to them and say, I want you raptured and saved too. In time. I want you saved. I want you in the storehouse of safety. Will you come into my barn? And one third of them will be saved. And God's going to turn his attention back to them. But before all the judgment comes, guys, know that you live in a day of mercy. A day of kindness. And that's what Jesus requires of us. What does the Lord require of you? Do the right thing when no one's looking. Be kind at all times and be humble at all times. What does the Lord require of you? To be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to being enraged and mad and angry and right. Be humble. You overlay those together, boom, boom, you're walking with Jesus. And not are you just walking with Jesus, you're not a bent reed. You're not a s just smoldering wick. You're useful and you're on fire. 
and you're good and you're the light of the kingdom of heaven. But what I'm doing is mundane. It's not about mundane. It's about taking the next step with the one who's in the yoke with you. There is nothing mundane about walking with Jesus. Are you kidding me? That's a life from hell. Are you walking with Jesus? That's everything. That's what God's called us to do. Take the next step. What is the next step He's telling you to take? My sheep hear my voice and they do the things that I say. They were mad at Jesus because He was taking away the crowds. He was healing people. He, he went against their religious system. They thought it was about them. They thought it was about the externals and not the heart of God. And Jesus was here about the heart of God. He was here to take care of people who were hurting for certain, even on the Sabbath day. Because the Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The whole point of that scripture is God was here to take care of us, is here to take care of us, and will continue to be here to take care of us at the moment we need it. Whether it's some special day that people look to, Christmas Day. Why, that's such a special day. Well, it's actually evil day. We need to learn that. We need to learn that Easter coming up. Easter is so pagan, God hates it with a passion. But he loves the Passover, which happens the very same day. He is our Passover. He's not our bunny rabbit. He's not our fertility king. He's our savior. He likes that holiday. We call them feast or moeds. That's what he likes. It's time for us to get into the mind of Christ and do what he says. These guys were making up their own rules, and if you don't play it by our game, you're out. Jesus is like, no, the rule book has been written for years. You need to go ahead and know what it's saying and do it. First base is first base. And when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from there, from getting killed, because it wasn't time to die in Capernaum or being stoned. And great multitudes followed him still. And he healed every one of them of every kind of disease and everything we've already looked at. And he encouraged them. He employed or implored that they would not tell folks about what's going on. But they did. Remember the guy that got his sight back? Boy, he's going to see everybody and tell everybody. The guy whose arm was just withered. Oh, no, you didn't. We saw him last week. He's going to show folk. You know what I'm saying? And he charged them that they should not make him known, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Hey, behold, I want you to look at my servant whom I have chosen. He's my beloved. My soul is well pleased with him. Remember we heard that at the baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Remember that? The Holy Spirit, like a dove descending on him. We have a picture of the Trinity right there. God's speaking. Jesus being baptized and the Holy Spirit descending on him in power. When people say there is no Trinity and that Jesus is not part of the Godhead, they are speaking from the spirit of Antichrist. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Every time it mentions negativity about Antichrist, John and the, the, the writers talk about the spirit of Antichrist is not believing in the doctrines of Christ, the deity of Christ. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put forth my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. And what does that mean? Jesus didn't come here as God. He came here as 100% man who was yielded to God to show us what it could be like to be men who were yielded to God. Okay, He was all God. At any moment he could have used Godhead powers, but that wasn't his mission. His mission was to come here as a man and lead. This is how you can have victory as a man. I'm not, I'm not different from you in, in my humanity. We're the same. I get hurt. I get hungry. I get thirsty. Hear my voice. Follow me. He says, he will not always strive nor cry. He's not going to fight. He's not going to argue. Guys, we're not here to argue Christianity. We're here to speak, and if somebody's willing to listen, to share with them. Don't waste your time having to scream and prove your point. You're never going to prove your point except for the fact that you're an idiot. That point will be well taken because you were disobedient. Disobedience to the Lord will always lead you in the position of being chief idiot. So we need to listen to the voice of God and do what he says. Not strive, not cry, not scream, blah, 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 blah. Just share the truth. Follow his example. A bruised reed, he didn't come here to take, the, take those who weren't in line with him and destroy him. That was not why he came. A smoking flax, fire in your eyeballs, people who are just ir irritable. He didn't come to snuff those people out. He wants them saved. Also, at the same time, he wants those of us who've already believed him, who still 
are bruised in life, who are still beaten up. He wants us to know that he can straighten us out and we are useful and we are great for the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't want you to stay a smoldering little piece of grass on fire. He wants you lit up. And he's the power and the source that will do that for you. He says, but I want you to know there is coming a judgment day when all this will happen and Jesus will be victorious in this when he goes out to do that. But it's not right now. It's very soon. Finally, in verse 21, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Do you trust him today? Do you trust what he said in his word he will perform? Do you trust that it will be live and real? Choose him today. Follow him today. And hang out with each other, like I'm saying. I love being with the people who aren't hypocritical, who I know has got my back when I ain't with you. And you need to know that we got your back when you ain't with us. You're cared for, you're prayed for, you're loved on. Trust in His name. Trust in Him. Trust in Him today.